fullness of God. Amen. I don't want to skip over that verse. I want to reread that just a little bit slower. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church, tell your neighbor, in the church, in the church. and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. I love this last line, world without end. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. So we're pulling some stuff into context here. Now I want you just to begin thinking about, let this get in your mind and begin thinking about what it means to be filled with the fullness of God. Amen. That's an incredible yeah. statement that he made. Amen. To be filled with the fullness of God. Amen. Now listen, this speaks to your capacity and my capacity. We sell ourselves so short sometimes in thinking that we can't accomplish anything significant or great. And a lot of times it's because we've been damaged in life and the things that we've encountered. We've encountered abuses and, 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 and control and manipulation and things like that. And so... It damages our psyche. Uh, it, 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 it has an effect on us. It alters us to a degree where we need healing to move past that. But you have tremendous capacity. And it's been shared here before through different ministers. But just let me just remind you of this. When Jesus stepped out of the boat on the shore uh, of a Gentile country, a man comes out of the tomb and meets him, a man they call Legion. <laughs> who one story says has a thousand demons in him, another story says a couple of thousand, another story says that there's a couple of men. But either way, I want you to see it. This I want this is the, the thing I want you to get your mind wrapped around. One man has in him a thousand spiritual entities. He is housing them, in, in, and he's not living a functional life, granted, because he's living out of the tombs. He's breaking chains that they put on him. He's, he's causing fear. He's being tormented, so he's tormenting. Maybe that's kind of the cycle. When you're being tormented, you end up inadvertently doing the same thing. And you don't mean to, but that's just the state that you're living in. And so he is out holding all of that in him, but it's to the negative degree. When Jesus comes and sets the man free, the spirits say, now we know that whole story. It was the battle was for the region because the spirits say, if you must make us leave, at least don't cast us out of the territory, right? So the story, there's the underlying theme is it's always a fight for territory. It's always a fight for a region. But he says, go into the swine. So the swine, 2,000 swine could not house what one man had inside of him. So they ran violently down a cliff off into the sea and killed themselves. So I'm only bringing that up because I want you to get that, that one man had in him what 2,000 pigs could not hold. Okay? It's tremendous capacity. Now, that's the negative side of it. The other side of it is that God created you so much like him that you were designed to house glory. That Christ in you is the hope of glory. You were designed to like him, created like him in his likeness, in his image. Now, that doesn't mean that God has blonde hair and blue eyes or brown hair. It doesn't mean that he's even shaped like this. But you're a spirit just like God. So that's where you were created in his image and his likeness. It had to do with your spiritual state of being and your spiritual capacity. You are just like your father. Amen? Okay, so the fullness of God is an incredible thing to think about. But he said you were designed to house that. Have you ever seen Men in Black? It's a pretty, pretty comical movie. It's a little gross for me. I don't like all that stuff. But uh, um, the cool part is in the first one. They're looking for something. These aliens come looking for the galaxy. They're looking for the galaxy. And uh, as this one alien dies, he says, the galaxy is in Orion's belt. And so uh, they're looking at these maps of the stars. And they're saying, it doesn't make any sense what he said. Because Orion's belt is this cluster of stars out here. It's not big enough to hold the galaxy. As it turns out later in the movie, Orion was the cat that the alien had, and in his belt was one little bitty thing that inside of this little bitty thing an entire galaxy was being housed. Yeah. Now, I immediately caught that. The rest yeah. of the movie disgusted me. But I caught that, and I, pre I started preaching that ever since. Because that describes you and me. We hold galaxies in us because God is in us. He's the one that holds the galaxies, amen? So in him and for him all things consist, but he lives in you. You house that. So our, 
Our goal here is to learn to become spiritual beings, not emotional beings and not fleshly beings. Yeah. It's what I preached on in Kenya this morning, by the way. To learn to govern our life from a spiritual position, not an emotional fleshly position. Yeah. And we're all guilty of it. Yeah. Every one of us get there from time to time. But the government of God won't flow through flesh and it won't flow through emotion. Right. It will only flow through spirit. Yeah. Right. And because we're designed to be spiritual. So, so that's, that, that's what I was sharing with them. When I wrapped up the word, the pastor, you know, I prayed over the congregation and said farewells to them. The pastor leaned into the tablet and he said, send me your notes. <laughs> like that. <And> he said, <laughs> so <laughs> I got to send those notes to him. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort. We're endeavoring, the King James might say, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The bond of peace. I bet that's a powerful bond. Amen. Amen. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called the one hope when you were called. These next few verses are not established in a doctrine, by the way, okay? They're talking about the unity of God, the completeness of God, the oneness of God. Not from a doctrinal or theological standpoint, but from a real standpoint. He's multifaceted. He has all these, all these dispositions, all of these manifestations, all of these dimensions of himself, but they all come together. He functions as one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but they function as one. They're one in function, one in purpose, one in unity. Amen? Amen. They're always, as a matter of fact, there's such an attraction between those three. Now, that's, that's another message for another time. But when you begin to look at the three, at, at Jesus, the Father, and the, and the Holy Spirit, you see the attraction that they have one for another. And in the encounters, they're always aware of one another and referencing one another. It's, it's powerful. It speaks of, of how together they really are, even when they're in different locations. Jesus is in the river being baptized. The Father is watching, and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove on him. And Jesus and Father speaks and says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So in three separate places, but they are one in function, one in purpose, okay? So there is a, there is a unity of the Spirit. And we keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Through the bond of peace. I want to get into that a little bit deeper. Uh, but it says that we must make every effort or endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. So I always tip my hand by posting stuff on Facebook. That's running through my spirit today before Sunday. So I posted this yesterday morning. Salvation is a free gift. Amen. But we work to keep unity. We work. It is an endeavor to keep the unity uh, of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So, so salvation is free. It's a gift. It came. Uh, it's, it's it's not free. I mean, it's not that there was no cost involved. It cost him everything. Amen. But it's a free gift to you and I. His blood is what saves us. But there is work to do. The work to do is to keep ourselves intact. Is to guard our connections. I want you to know this. I don't say this lightly either. There's absolutely nothing the enemy of your soul can do to stop you. Right. There is nothing he can do to stop you unless you become disconnected or disjointed or discombobulated from the rest of the body of Christ. Because in doing that, what you do is you cut the life flow off. And so that you're not receiving everything that you need in your life to stand tall and to stand strong. And you find yourself a little bit of an easier target as a lone ranger, amen? We're not all lone wolf McQuaid. <laughs> we're not, no, that's, that's, that's a real throwback for you right there. <laughs> so uh, we're, not, we're, we're not isolated individually. We're not superheroes. Uh, even though we do have the Spirit of God in us, corporately we were designed to be connected to one another. Okay, so this is not why. This is why, actually, I don't preach church attendance as a legalistic thing because it's not. It has nothing to do with you going to heaven. But it does have to do with you living in heaven and releasing heaven from your life. What I mean is this. I mean that going to church is just one aspect of staying connected to the rest of the body. It's one aspect of it. It's one dimension of it. So it's, it's us coming together, recognizing that we're not the only ones going through stuff in life. But you're going through stuff. I'm going through stuff. She is. He is. We all come together in a setting like this. and We draw strength from one another. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can feel it. Every time we come together, I can feel the flow. I can feel the unity. I can feel the peace, the strength, the synergy 
of the body dwelling together in unity, okay? So that's very important, and not for a, from a legalistic standpoint, but uh, it's, it's just it's designed that way. We're designed that way. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given, as Christ has apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and he gave gifts to people. What's he ascended mean? except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens, comma, in order to fill the whole universe. Amen. 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 So it's his goal, it's his objective, that you be filled with the fullness of God, that the earth be filled with the glory of God, and that the universe be filled with the fullness of God as well. All right. Now, I understand that he is everywhere. Spiritually speaking, he is everywhere. But what we're after is we're after importing an invisible realm into a visible realm. So we are not doing something that's not already done in the spirit, but we're taking what's done in the spirit and importing it into the seen realm, into the seen world, so that this earth is filled with the glory of God. Now, I know that spiritually speaking, the universe is full of him already, and all things consist by him and for him. I know that, but what he has designed us to do and anointed us to do is to bring that into our realm, bring that into our world and make our world here look like his world, okay? And one of the ways that this accomplished is so Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works and ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up Amen. till we all reach unity in the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So you see that there's a theme here of fullness. He's, he's addressing this issue of fullness uh, and maturity and, and the knowledge of Christ and the body of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, in other words, in, in opposition to that or against that, contrary to that, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is, who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by, what every, by every supporting ligament, or by what every joint supplies, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Amen? Amen. Amen? So God is filling the whole universe with Christ, the fullness of Christ. Amen. He's filling every nook and cranny of this earth with the glory of God. Amen? Okay? Amen. Now, one of the things that we need to establish that we're kind of establishing here, and, it's, and there are other churches doing it as well, is that God's not intending on wiping this earth out. He's not bent on destroying this earth. He's not bent on destroying humanity. It's not in his heart. That's right. It's not in the Father's heart. And only a misunderstanding of Scripture leads you to that conclusion. Amen. Studying out of context, getting the covenants mixed up, not understanding what covenant we're operating in right now. Those things cause you to get this understanding that the world's about to end, or the earth is about to end, or, 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 or destruction and tribulation is about to come on the planet. But that's not what the Bible says. On Wednesday night, we started looking at that subject a little bit deeper this past Wednesday night. We're going to for a few Wednesday nights, uh, the, the next few Wednesday nights coming up. But it's his purpose to fill this earth with his glory. And he does it through you and I, and he's doing it through you and I, and he will continue to do it through, through us, okay? And he does that through the church. The church is designed to be a bit, not the, not the building, but us, okay? This is, church is not an organization, it's an organism. It's alive, it's living. Yeah. So we are together connected. We are, when we are all together lovely when we're all together, amen? So when we come together, then we're lovely. We're a, we're, we're a thing that the earth is not familiar with and doesn't understand, but there's a corporate anointing that comes on us when we're together, when there's togetherness, when there's unity. I, uh, it's been a theme of mine for years, and I've caught a lot of flack for it because I've talked about the unity that is increasing in the body of Christ, and I have other ministers that will challenge that, and they will say there will never be unity on the planet. And I'm like, man, I don't know, I don't know where you're studying or how you're studying or from what woundedness you're speaking from. But the thing is, is that we think we have to all be agreed for there to be unity. And so, you know, if it's all based upon us agreeing on everything, 
Yeah, I agree. There'll never be unity. Right. Yeah. But that's not what it's based on. It's based on love. Yeah. Yeah. It's based on us understanding yeah. that we are we can love one another even when we don't agree. Right. That there can be a synergy and a connectivity when we honor one another's giftings. Amen. Uh, so in a pastoral conference, conference or gathering, you have all these pastors there. They may represent different churches or denominations or belief systems. But that doesn't mean that just because they're together that everybody there agrees the same on every single issue. There may be some, some in the room that have a victorious eschatology. There may be some in the room that believe that it's all about to, to go, you know, go to hell in a handbasket. Uh, so, but they can come together, and if we have honor present, we can honor one another's giftings, callings, offices, functions. We can honor their ministries, and just because you're not flowing in my stream doesn't mean you're not part of the river. Amen. 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 There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Amen. The city of God is New Jerusalem. It's a spiritual city. The river comes from the throne, but there are many branches off of it, yeah. many streams off of that river. So just because the, 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 the mistake that a stream makes is by thinking that they are the river. When a stream itself begins to believe that they're the river, uh -huh. then they begin to develop an isolationist mentality and they stay away from everyone that's not like them. Right. But you know, when you only fellowship with people that are like you, it is homosexuality. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It is you coming together feeling like you can only be with those that are like you. Yeah. I got news for you. I know I'm being a little bit mature here. You can have some fun that way, but you'll never produce fruit that way. Amen. You will never produce fruit that way. Only when you're willing to come together with people that are not like you, but are in fact opposite of you. And honor them and love them and come together can fruit come from that relationship. That's the principle the body of Christ is beginning to get now, begin to, beginning to understand, okay? Yeah. That we can come together. I can go to somebody else's conference even though that I'm not flowing in the stream they're flowing in. Someone else can come to my conference and they're not flowing in the stream I'm flowing in, but I honor them and I honor where they're at. I honor what they're hearing and I honor what they're doing because they may be passionate about that because God put that in them. Right. I'm passionate about the obvious things that I'm passionate about. It's, it's, it's reformation, truth, revelation, the kingdom, the kingdom in us now, victorious eschatology. These are things... I'm passionate about, and people sometimes wish I'd shut up and get off of it. I can't get off of it. It's what's in me. It's all I have in me. It's what's burning in me and rolling in me and resonating in me. And it will find its way out of every sermon I preach. Every message I preach, it's going to find a way to come out somehow at some point because that's the stream that I flow in. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So he's filling the whole earth with the glory of God. It's not his heart to destroy the earth. It's his heart to fill it with the glory of God. I don't have time to get into that because if you're wondering, well, what about the verses that say heaven and earth are going to pass away and this and that? I, I don't have time to tackle that this morning, but get Wednesday night CD, okay? Because I really dealt with that in detail. So it's his purpose for the church to demonstrate on this planet here and now a kingdom of sons. For all kings and priests under Jesus, he's the king of kings, he's the lord of lords. But do, do you see that? He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. So that means we are anointed to be kings and priests or lords in the earth realm. Not capital L, but we are. What, what does a Lord do? A Lord just governs. A Lord rules and has dominion. That's all it's talking about. Okay. So this is not talking about the nobility of particular nations. This is talking about his sons and daughters. His sons and daughters in the earth. He's king of kings. He's lord of lords. Okay? So sons is not a gender-specific statement. In the new covenant, sons refers to maturity of identity. Amen. It's when we, it has nothing to do with male and female because in the new covenant, they're, they're, male, they're not male or female. That's not how he views us. That's not how he sees us. He sees us as spirit. He sees us like him. Here we relate to one another in those terms but in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of God, those terms really uh, don't exist. We're just, we're sons of God. Amen. We're the mature sons of God or we're the children of God, one or the other, okay? So the earth is voice activated to the sons of God. Right. The earth is voice activated to the sons of God. So the earth is waiting to hear what the mature sons are saying. Yeah. Amen. Amen? That's what this earth is waiting to hear. Now, that doesn't mean 
Now, the voice doesn't mean whining and complaining and protesting. That's not what the earth, that, that makes the earth groan, in fact. The groaning that Romans 8 talks about is because the earth groans when we bellyache and moan and complain and whine and protest because we're not called to protest, we're called to prophesy. That's our anointing as sons in the earth is to prophesy to this earth from a mature mouth. Amen. From Amen. a mature mouth with a mature word because we are born again by the incorruptible seed of God's word. Yeah. People are born again when you start preaching the gospel. Yeah. That's what draws men and women to Christ is the gospel, the pure gospel of what he did on the cross. Amen. You're not going to draw too many people by preaching hellfire and brimstone. You will get some saved, but they're being saved out of fear. Yeah. And, and I'm not so sure that there's a transformation happening as much as they're just there's a response happening. They're just responding out of fear. But if you get someone saved through fear, then you got to keep them safe through fear. Yeah. Then you got to continually keep them scared. But how many of you know there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ yeah. Jesus? Yeah. So I don't have to use fear. We don't have to use fear. We use love. And love draws people to Christ. Yeah. When they hear how much God loves this world. Not one day when they straighten their act up, but now. Man, yeah. He loves this world. He, and why he demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Amen. So that's the demonstration of his great love that he has for us. Amen. Okay. And I didn't even think I had anything to say today. <laughs> so let me just talk. Let me just remind you of a couple things that we talked about about two years ago. Um, as we established kind of grace center structure systems and networks. Uh, here as we move forward, the, I, I brought up several places there in Ephesians 3 and Ephesians 4 where it talks about the fullness of God. Yeah. The earth being filled with the fullness, us being filled with the fullness. The reason why there's been such a, a returning to apostolic ministry and restoration of apostolic ministry is because it's the only administration that can house the glory of God. Amen. It's designed that way scripturally. Amen. Apostolic ministry. There's a, a, a full, uh, fivefold ministry. The word is called apostolic ministry, but that doesn't mean it's just all about the apostles. They're just part of it. They're a key part of it. But they're just part of it. But a full fivefold ministry is designed to house the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So. When we talk about apostleship or someone who's an apostle, our Western mindset wants to start picturing a hierarchy chart. Right. Yeah. We want yeah. to know who's in charge, yeah. who's in charge of what. And so we start putting these charts together by trying to determine who's on the top of it. But that's not the New Testament model of church government. Yeah. Um, instead, think of it this way. Think of the five major organs of the body. Five major, major organs that we need to be healthy. And they all work together and are connected one to the other. Each one having a vital function to the health of your body. Yeah. And that's really what fivefold ministry is about. Every one of the fivefold ministry is important to the health of the body. And so what we've seen historically this last, this last 50, 50 years, especially 50 to 70 years, we've seen uh, restoration of evangelists and pastor, and teacher. In the, in, the, in the 90s, we started seeing, uh, or the 80s and 90s, we started seeing the prophet, the office of a prophet restored. And then the late 90s and on into the 2000s, the apostle was restored. And then after that, after the body of Christ started receiving full five-fold ministry again, because she had stopped for a while, and it was just all about pastors. For the longest time, it was just all, there was the Western mindset was there's, it's, there's, a one, there's one man in charge of everything. He does everything. And we just called them pastors. What we really did was burned a lot of pastors out right. by putting responsibilities on them that they were never designed to carry by themselves. A lot of them were functioning as other things, but we were just calling them pastors. So that brought a lot of confusion to the body of Christ because they're wondering, well, if you're a pastor, why aren't you caring for me personally? Yeah. Why are you spending time with me? Why aren't you fellowshipping with me? Why are you not at my bedside when I'm sick? And in, and in fact, what we were doing a lot of times when there were prophets and apostles or teachers that we were calling pastors, it's not even in their heart to go sit at your bedside. Yeah. It's not at their heart to sit in fellowship with you, but they were doing it, but they were doing it begrudgingly yeah. mm -hmm. because their gift had them in a different, pulling them over to a different location. But there are true, genuine pastors in the body of Christ that that's their passion. Yeah. Yeah. They want to hang out with you. 
They want, they are from the people, among the people. They have a heart for the people. They want to fellowship and love on people. Be there for all of the crisis moments of your life. Let it do weddings and funerals and all of that stuff. They want to be a big, big part of your life. And that is a function of pastor. That is a very pastoral ministry. So we have, sometimes we've thought that you can't be a pastor unless you have a church. That's, that's a false assumption. It's a false assumption. There are people all over this community that have shepherd's hearts. A pastor's heart and the function of a pastor in their life. You don't have to have a church to be a pastor. And, and even if you are part of a church, you don't have to be in charge of that church to be a pastor. Yeah, it, it still trips some of my friends out when I talk to them and tell them that we've got five or six pastors in our church. And they're like, whoa, <laughs> but how, what do you mean? How's, how does that work out? Well, first of all, you know, they just don't understand apostolic model of government, okay? Okay, so let me get into it for a couple more minutes this morning. I'll shift gears, share one more thought with you, and then I'll get out of the way. Um, did you ever notice that Paul, who was an incredible apostle, by the way, but he never put apostle in front of his name. He always put it after <laughs> Yeah, have you ever noticed that? He always started his letters off with Paul, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why. That's because Paul didn't see apostle as a title. He saw it as a function. It was a function he was called to. It was a job description. So let's talk about what the fivefold ministry does. And let's look at the hand uh, as a comparison. The apostle governs. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're the only one who calls shots. That just means an apostle's ministry function is to identify other giftings and functions and to govern by setting things in place and setting people in place, okay? So an apostle sometimes will see things in other people that you didn't see, uh, or a prophet could do that as well. So, so the apostle governs, the balance of your hand comes from your thumb, comes from your thumb. If you were to tragically lose your thumb, guess what? You're going to have problem learning to hold stuff again. You're really going to have a lot of problem learning to hold stuff and have the balance necessary. The prophet guides, that's the index finger. The, the index finger is what points. So the prophet is called to guide and to point and to bring clarity of direction and purpose. And so the apostles and prophets are called in Scripture to function together. They really do need each other. Because a prophet that doesn't have an apostle in his life could get a heavy dose sometimes and get off balance with pointing all the time, and prophesying all the time, but, but no governmental structure ever being put in place. And likewise, an apostle could spend all of his time with governmental structure and sitting there all the time talking about structure this and organization that and system this and system that. The prophet's like, shut up already. Let's go somewhere. Let's move. Let's get some, you know, some momentum and movement going here. So they're really called to function together. And they're the most effective when they're functioning together. The teacher grounds the body of Christ. Look at your small finger. Really, the small finger is the only one that fits into your ear, that can get down into your ear. Because a teacher's function is to get into your ear to make sure that you're hearing what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to the church. You might not like this guy, but I think that he's one of the most complete pictures of a teacher that I've ever run across in my life, and that's Mark Shell. He is a teacher. He is an anointed teacher that has a way of getting in your ear, and sometimes he'll stick you the wrong way too. But you know what? That's, a, that's part of their job. Part of their job is to confront mindsets and confront, uh, confront areas to see if you can be offended in an area or not. Because as Mark says, sometimes I will offend you on purpose because the area you're offendable in is the area you're unteachable in. <laughs> I believe it, man. So, so he's that way. So that, you know, but that's what a real teacher will do, find out how teachable you are. And sometimes you don't even know yourself how teachable you are until somebody ticks you off bad enough. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So an evangelist gathers. The evangelist is the middle finger. You'll understand if I don't just hold up the middle finger, right? <laughs> he has the longest reach. The evangelist extends, okay? The evangelist goes further than the rest of them. He reaches out. Now, the pastor is the covenant finger. The pastor is the one that is married to the church in covenant relationship with the church. The pastor is the shepherd willing to lay his life down. 
pastor the one who really has a heart for the people of God. So God has restored those offices, but he's establishing all over the earth now apostolic ministry back to the body of Christ. And the reason why is because it's the only administration that understands body ministry, Amen. and it's the only administration that can manifest true unity. Amen. Because it's not about a hierarchy, right. but it's about a body. So in my body, they're, they're say that the, the five major organs... What would, what would happen one day if my organs began to rebel against one another and argue over who was the most important organ? Yeah. Yeah. Now, that sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? No. I mean, when you think about it from that perspective, but when you begin to spend time trying to figure out who's in charge and who the most important necessary component is or the most important part, you're missing the bigger picture. Yeah. Because we all need each other. Yeah. And we all have a function, a very specific function, okay? So... Apostolic ministry eliminates hierarchy, and it does away with one-man shows. And watch this in the days ahead. You're going to see less and less superstar ministers Amen. and superstar ministries. It's not going to be about the one-man show and one man rising to stardom, but it's going to be about it's going to be about regions where apostolic ministry is established. Now we already have models of them starting to pop up around the country. Bethel is a perfect model of it. But there are other ones. There are other ones that are less well-known. Global Sphere Centers. One, there are numerous ones out in Florida that I'm aware of that I fellowship with out there. But um, matter of fact, Grace Center is becoming one. Amen. Amen. Now, not everybody around the country knows about us, but there are some all over the country that know about us and some around the world too. That's right. Let me shift gears for just a minute and talk about kingdom networking. This will be the last thought I share with you. Luke shares a story about Jesus telling Peter to launch out into the deep to catch the drought of fish. He, he shares that story. And uh, John shares a similar story, but it's at a different point in Jesus' ministry. In, uh, uh, so when Luke shares the story, Jesus comes to the seashore. They're fishing. They've toiled all night. They've caught nothing. Amen? They've worked hard, toiled, caught nothing. He tells them to go deeper. Okay, so he's telling them to fish harder, fish deeper. But in John chapter 21, a different scenario plays out. Let's just turn over there real quick. Let me read a few of the verses here. John chapter 21, verse 1. After this, Jesus let himself be seen and revealed again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he did it in this way. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called the twin, and Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, also the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, and we are coming with you. So they went out and got into the boat. Throughout that night they caught nothing. Morning was already breaking when Jesus came to the beach and stood there. However, the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any meat or fish? Have you caught anything to eat? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. This, I want to highlight something here. Before, when this had happened to them, he tells them, he instructs them to cast deep. So their abundance is connected to their obedience. And I want to repeat that. Their abundance is connected to their obedience. Yeah. Yeah. After the cross, though, and after the resurrection, he comes out and a, and a familiar scene is playing out. He this time tells them, cast your net on the right side of the boat for a large catch. So rightly dividing the word of truth is, is when we begin to understand what is truth in relation to the old covenant and what is truth in relation to the new covenant. That's one aspect of rightly dividing the word of truth. So this time they cast their net on the right side of the boat and they catch a large drought of fish. And they're, this time their, their, their abundance is tied to his obedience. Because on the right side of the cross, it's about, what, it's about the obedience of the son, the last Adam. And, and, and on the, before the cross, we have to hear and obey. And obedience is still helpful in the new covenant. But all of our abundance is tied to his obedience. Yeah. It's all about what he accomplished on our behalf. So they cast the net, and now they were not able to hold it in for such a large catch. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said, Peter, it is the Lord. Simon Peter, hearing him say that it was the Lord, girded on his outer garment and his fisherman's coat, and for he was stripped and sprang into the sea. The other disciples came in the small boat, for they were not far from the shore, only some hundred yards away. 
dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish lying on it and bread. Did you notice that? That he comes up, small things like that get my attention. He comes up to him and he says, do you have any fish? And then he tells them to go on the right side of the boat. But by the time they get from the shore back to the beach, he already has fish cooking for him. It's a picture of the finished work is what it's a picture of. Okay, so he had a finished work prepared for them already when they got back to the shore. So he says to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Let's get it put. Let's put it all together here. So Simon went aboard and hauled the net to land full of large fish, 153 of them. Though there were so many, the net was not torn. Now let me just talk to you for just a second. Uh, Brother David was sharing one time as well, and he kind of touched on this, Brother David Culver, and uh, a great teacher, by the way. A lot of you guys don't get to hear him because he teaches on Wednesday nights, but uh, he's, he's got a lot of knowledge and wisdom. And I love it that God is surrounding me with people that have knowledge and wisdom and experience. I love it. I'm telling you, it's humbling that he's connecting our ministry to guys like Tony Miller, Terry Bates, you know, and then all of the other guys, Jamie Englehart, Nate Blouse, and that he's sending people into our ministry here locally that have that much wisdom. Okay, 153, very specific number, wouldn't you agree? Very specific number. And it's not an accident, I promise you that. Um, when you start digging into this subject, I'm just going to tell you that as, as I begin to research it in my book on the numbers in, in Scripture, this is not something I pulled out, this is something I, I, I read in this book on numbers in Scripture. He, uh, he gets into the math of God's Word and the numbers that are, that are so detailed in God's Word. And he says this, okay? He says there were 153 varieties of fish in the Sea of Tiberias. Now that's interesting. 153 varieties of fish in the Sea of Tiberias. Okay, number two, Hebrew and Greek letters have numerical value as well. So a Hebrew and a Greek letter or a word, not only is, not only is it a word or a letter, but it's also a picture, especially the Hebrew, is a picture, but Hebrew and Greek have numerical value. So all of the letters have individual numerical value. And that method of study is called, is called the gematria of the word, uh, understanding the gematria of the word, okay? So uh, the numerical value of the word fishes in the Greek is the Greek word ichthus, and it, the numerical value is 153. Wow. Let's just blow our minds together for a few minutes here. The numerical value of the words, the nets, the nets, is 1,224 which is 8 times 153. 8 is the number of new beginnings in Scripture. So the word, the nets, is 8 times 153. The Hebrew phrase, benai ha Elohim, it means the sons of God. Benai ha Elohim means the sons of God, and that phrase is in Scripture seven times. How many of you want to take a guess at what the numerical value is? 153. The expression creation of God is in Scripture also valued at 1,224, which is 8 times 153. There were exactly 153 individual persons mentioned in Scripture that were blessed by Jesus personally in one-on-one -on -one encounters when he was on the earth. Individually touched and blessed by him personally. So anyway, the typology that's at work here is that the finished, this is what I want you to see, the finished work typology is that through Jesus, God was reaching down into creation to pull out his sons and see to it that not one of them were lost. Amen. 153 represented one from every species of fish that were in the Sea of Galilee. And the heart of the Father is that not anyone should be lost. Amen. Amen. That's the heart of the, of the Father. Amen. Amen. So it's incredible. It's an incredible time. One more verse I want to share with you. Uh, and it's Ephesians chapter 5. So we started at 3, chapter 4, now chapter 5. Uh, those details jump out at me, like how nets and fishing were involved in the calling of the four disciples. In the restoration of, of Peter and the disciples, nets and fishing were once again involved. Uh, Jesus used fish, he used nets to teach kingdom principles all throughout his time with them, okay? I believe we're living in days right now that are strategic, transitional, and divinely energized from heaven. 
The days that we're living in are alive with opportunity and excitement. Now, I understand that there's some fear out there of uncertainty and unknown, but I'm not going to focus on that, or at least I'm not going to meditate on that. I'm, I might look at it from time to time to see if God has something to say to me about it, but I'm not going to meditate on uncertainty and unknown. Amen. What I am going to meditate on is God's Word, Amen. because these are exciting days that we're living in. Ephesians 5 verse 16 says, and I'm reading out of the Amplified Bible, Live purposefully, worthily, and accurately, not as the unwise and witless, <laughs> but as wise, sensible, intelligent people, making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the, of the Lord is. Now, three words, all three words describe, I believe, characteristic of the church right now, purposeful accurate and intelligent so three words those are three areas where reformation is sweeping through the body of christ right now helping us to become empowering us to become purposeful accurate and intelligent amen, amen. Uh, <clears throat> change is taking place at a rapid rate all over the world amen. and the body of christ that that recognizes it learns to tap into it and to flow with it and as long as we don't resist it, we'll always be a part of, of, of God's divine aligning and connecting and reconnecting. And sometimes he disconnects before he connects. Amen? Sometimes he, he disconnects different areas before he reconnects us or connects us for the first time in this area. Uh, but I'm going to stop right there. There's other stuff I could share, but we're getting up close to 12, and I don't want to keep you too late today. But... Um, it's exciting times that we're living in. It's exciting to be alive in the kingdom of God right now. I love traveling. I love sharing the word of God. It's in my heart. I'm going to miss you guys. I'm not after this morning. You won't hear from me again until Easter Sunday morning. Uh, it's on a Sunday morning. I take that back. I'll be preaching Wednesday night. So, um, And then when we, we return on a Tuesday, I'll be preaching again that Wednesday night as well. But on a Sunday, some of you I won't see again until Easter Sunday morning. But just keep us in, the, in your prayers and uh, pray over the trip mm -hmm. and uh, watch Facebook because we will post updates and we'll let you know what we're doing from day to day and where we're going to be ministering at and that sort of thing. And uh, pray about this trip. Amen. It's, it's going to be an awesome time. Pastor Raymond Graham is going to be here soon. And uh, let me get, I say soon, the end of March. Let me look at my calendar. No, I'm not going there yet, but I'm, I'm... Oh, to Kenya? No, not that I know of. But I will go. I'm going to go to Kenya. Raymond is going to be arriving on March 31st, and he's going to be here for one week. So he's going to be preaching here on April 3rd, but it's a Sunday night service because I've got him in to Pastor Tories on Sunday morning. Uh, so it's going to be a Sunday night service here, and... Um, but just, just a couple more things, just real quick. I like the Apostle Paul sharing, trying to cover all the ground before I leave. <laughs> um, remember these two speakers coming in. Let's take care of Pastor Kelly and Pastor Peter next week. The Sunday after that, Pastor Aaron Bird, he is coming in. He has a mission strip coming up. So what he's doing right now is he's raising funds. That's, he was calling everybody. He's working. He's fundraising, doing everything he can to raise money for some trips coming up. So... Let's sow into him that Sunday morning. So it's not next Sunday, but it will be the 20th, I believe. The 20th, when he's here at the end of the service, let's receive a good offering and sow into his, into his life and into his upcoming trip. Aaron is growing a lot. Man, I've seen such a lot of maturity and development and growth in his life. I'm very proud of him. I've known that young man since he was a boy. He was in my youth group when I was a youth pastor. So that's, that starts dating me, amen? But he is anointed, talented, gifted guy and has a real heart for, for the gospel. Amen. So you'll be blessed. Hallelujah. Let's stand up.